welcome back! My Covid adventure is almost over, but I try to keep making new videos as this is an excellent distraction. Once again, the topic is the Great War, and I will take a look at whether there was any possibility of a German victory. Let's see whether we can come up with a clear explanation. When we look at World War I in detail, we sometimes get the feeling that the Central Powers were actually quite close to a final victory. After all, they did emerge victorious on the Eastern Front. They managed to overwhelm smaller countries like Serbia, Montenegro and Romania, and also held back the Entente armies on many different theaters of war. What's more, in mid-1918, a last German gamble once again pushed back French, British and American forces, and for a brief moment it seemed like Paris could be occupied. Of course, we know that it didn't happen. In fact, it was just an illusion, maybe even from the start, when the war broke out. On the surface, Germany had great odds of winning. It had the best army in the world, with the best officers and NCOs, who led millions of well-trained and sufficiently educated soldiers. Its navy was also impressive, and although it was smaller than the Royal Navy, it was a threat that Britain could not ignore. Actually, this threat led to the war itself. I sometimes hear the excuse that Germany always had weak allies, but this was also for a good reason. Stronger powers had all been alienated long before the war. The plan was that the main partner, Austria-Hungary, would keep the enormous Russian army at bay, while France is quickly subdued. Then most German forces would be transported to the east to finish off the Russian Empire before it can fully mobilize its forces. While this was risky, the goal seemed achievable, as long as France could be knocked out quickly. However, Germany was running out of time, not just in terms of execution of existing military plans, but also when it came to the balance of power on the European continent. The naval race with the British had already been lost, Germany simply could not keep building huge battleships at the same rate, while also maintaining a large army. France was expanding its own army, and also provided huge loans to Russia to allow it to develop infrastructure, making it possible to mobilize at a faster rate. This is one of the reasons Germany approved Austria-Hungary's initial moves against Serbia in the summer of 1914. They knew that the war could not be delayed any longer. Time was against them. Right at the outbreak of hostilities, victory seemed at hand as seven German armies invaded France and Belgium, while only one was guarding the Russian border. Paris was not reached, though, partly because Belgian defense held out longer, but also because the widespread use of machine guns made offensives very costly in human life. This was not a repetition of 1870, which also meant that war on two fronts was now inevitable. At the same time, the Navy was unable to break the British blockade, as both sides refused to risk direct confrontation. Apart from a few exceptions, like the Battle of Jutland, the main naval forces did not encounter each other, as nobody wanted to lose the new and very expensive Dreadnought-class battleships. The conflict became a war of attrition, which the Central Powers could not win. In this war, it didn't matter how many battles the German, Austro-Hungarian, Bulgarian and Ottoman armies won, because the Entente powers could always replace their losses, relying on their vast colonial empires and newly joined allies. Serbia was finally overrun in mid-1915, Montenegro was occupied not long after, Italy could not beat the relatively weak Austro-Hungarian forces in the mountains, and Romania was quickly invaded after it attacked Hungary. After the initial blunders, which cost Austria-Hungary more than one million men, the mighty Russian army was gradually pushed back, and among the great powers, Russia collapsed first. Russia gave up fighting for the same reasons the Central Powers would eventually lose. It was running out of resources, and even increasing Entente shipments could not prevent the degradation of economic and military power. Loyalty towards Tsar Nicholas II was diminishing. Each new offensive cost more of the trained officers that Russia could not afford to lose. 
Ordinary Russians, whose standard of living was already lower, felt that the war could not bring any future gains, it simply led to more killing. The country could manage one last successful offensive in 1916, organized by General Brasilov, but this major attack, which almost led to the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian army, effectively consumed all remaining Russian resources. Once the Tsar was gone, the Republic chose to continue the war, which is why a second revolution would happen within a few months. On the Western Front, breakthrough seemed next to impossible. Each new battle, Verdun, the Somme, Passchendaele, etc., cost hundreds of thousands of men. While the navy was unable to pose a threat to Britain, so Germany opted for a submarine campaign instead. This change in strategy basically acknowledged that the original plan failed. A quick victory did not happen, and since it was too late to talk about peace, new methods had to be tried. Submarines would disrupt British food supplies, poison gas would reduce losses in the battlefield, and airplanes would help the army bomb Britain and boost morale, especially as famous aces became propaganda tools. Perhaps the most important development was the so-called stormtrooper tactics, which focused on smaller, well-equipped units that could overwhelm the enemy without suffering huge casualties. It did help, but in the end, the decisive factor was economic power, which relied on available human and natural resources. Russia was knocked out, but the United States joined, and it could quickly build up a sizable force, not to mention fresh supplies in food and raw materials. It was this that saved France in 1917 when the army mutinied. The country would have collapsed without the timely delivery of American wheat, while morale was also boosted by the arrival of the first US troops. Germany didn't have such an ally. It was cut off from the world by the blockade. It had lost contact with its colonies long before, so it had to rely on its existing allies and the total exploitation of occupied territories. After the American entry, the Central Powers lost all chance of winning. Turkey was already retreating in the Middle East, Bulgaria barely managed to hold the line in Greece, while Austria-Hungary's soldiers, especially the ones that returned from Russian captivity, desired peace and didn't want to be sent to the Italian front. While the initial German attacks in March and April 1918 were successful, losses were very high. Their troops were amazed to see fresh, well-equipped and fed Entente forces, while they themselves needed captured supplies to keep going. It was obvious that Germany was running out of steam. By that time, both Germany and Austria were starving, and while exploiting Ukraine did bring in some food, this was never going to be enough. By the summer, no more gains could be achieved in France, while more and more American troops were coming in. Defeat was now just a matter of time. Germany's main problem was not a military one. It just had way too many enemies and only a handful of friends. And those friends were also intimidated or terrified by Germany's power. One could say that the outcome of the war had been decided decades before the actual conflict, when Germany pushed Russia and France into each other's arms and started threatening Britain as well. Rapid economic development was one thing. Demanding more colonies was a big no-no. With some sarcasm, we can say that Britain and France wanted to civilize all barbarians on their own. They didn't wish any German assistance in this noble task. Since Germany kept pushing, war had to come. And Germany's geostrategic position would determine the outcome on its own. I think this answers the question in the title. I hope I was able to provide a proper explanation. I'm not yet sure what I will talk about in the next episode, but there are plenty of interesting questions regarding the Great War, so I'm not very concerned about that. See you next time!